What is Congregationalism? This is part two of a two-part series trying to define that thing that came from those beautiful white buildings, those beautiful white churches you see in New England. Now, of course, Congregationalism is much more than just a building. It's a theological movement. And that we're going to find in this video, or part two of our series, taking a look at the tradition of Congregationalism. Because Congregationalism is fundamentally two things. It is a form of church government, and it is a Christian tradition. In the first video, we looked at the church government. And let's recap it briefly. Congregationalism as government believes that the local church is self-governing that it's capable of existing by itself. Yes, it can belong to a denomination, but it doesn't have to. A local church is a true church of Christ as long as it's following the gospel and the word of God. And finally, Congregationalism believes in a democratic form of church government that the final say is with the voting members of that local body. But that's the church government. What is historic traditional congregationalism. What is congregationalism, big C congregationalism as a tradition? Well, it's four things. It's Christian, and we're going to start from the big picture and go to the small. It is then Protestant. It is Reformed or Calvinistic. And then finally, it's from the English Puritan tradition. So let's go through all these four things briefly. So historic congregationalism, the congregational tradition, is Christian. It affirms what is called Nicene Christianity. This is Orthodox Christianity. This is the Christianity that comes out of the Bible. Because in the early centuries, after the Bible was closed, there was two big issues the church had to fight about. And it was about the very nature of God. In the early church, the Nicene church, uh, that word comes, by the way, from the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed, the great creeds of the early church that define Orthodox Christianity. They believed that God is triune, that there is only one God who co-eternally and co-equally exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And also they believe in what's called the hypostatic union, that Jesus Christ is fully man and fully God. All Christians believe in these core doctrines. Now, Nicene Christianity, Orthodox Christianity, lasted about a thousand years. It eventually split, though, in 1054, for basically political reasons, between the eastern and western part of the Roman Empire, in what's called the Great Schism. And it divided into the eastern side, which would be called Eastern Orthodoxy, and the western side, which would be called Roman Catholic. Now, the western side, the Roman Catholic Church, would split in 1517 during the Reformation where a group of Christians rose up and said the Roman Catholic Church was corrupt and it needed to be reformed. And this created the Protestant tradition because they were protesting against the Roman Catholics. So Congregationalism is Protestant. And Protestantism has some core distinctive doctrines. First and foremost, it believes the final authority is Scripture alone that scripture trumps tradition or church hierarchies. Yes, you can have tradition. Yes, you can have church hierarchies. But the final authority is always with scripture. Also, Protestants argued that the Roman Catholic Church had corrupted the gospel, and therefore it had to be purified. And that means we are justified by grace alone, through faith alone, account of Christ alone. So these two issues, the gospel and the authority of the church based on scripture, is what defines Protestantism. Now, Protestants, like all different traditions, eventually split. And early on, it split into really two big divisions. The first one was Lutheran, or Lutheranism, founded by Martin Luther. But the second group that came from the Reformation, and the larger group, is what's called the Reformed tradition, or Calvinism. Now, Congregationalism is of this Reformed tradition. It is Calvinistic. And so what are the core distinctives of Reformed theology? Well, first and foremost, Reformed theology is theocentric. It focuses on the sovereignty of God. It wants to have a God-centered theology, not a man-centered theology. And to this end, the Reformed tradition believes God ordains all things. So what happens to us in the end is by the hand of God, and we're called to remain faithful. 
it also believes that salvation is monergistic, which means salvation is all the work of God. It is solely by God's grace. Roman Catholicism believes in synergism, that God and man must cooperate. The Reformed tradition believes salvation is monergistic. It is solely of the grace of God. Another Reformed distinctive is that it is bibliocentric. When the Bible speaks, God speaks. So therefore, Scripture has final say in all things. Now, many Christian traditions believe the Bible is the authoritative word of God. But the Reformed tradition, more than most, believes that all of Scripture is for all of life. So the Scriptures speak authoritatively, not just for the church, but also for the individual, for families, and for even nations. That all organizations, all groups should turn to the scriptures and the scripture is knowable to the common person by ordinary means and that it applies to all of life. And so it had a very full sense that the Bible should be the center of all our thinking. Another distinctive Reformed theology is that it's covenantal. And if you want to understand the Bible, you should understand how covenants work. And so therefore, since covenants are critical, the church is a covenant fellowship. It's a gathering of saints and priests, and all Christians are saints, and all Christians are priests. And therefore, for the congregational tradition, it believes in infant baptism, that the children of believers are part of the covenant relationship of the church. Congregationalism, therefore, is Christian, Protestant, Reformed, and it's Puritan. It's from that tradition that thought the English state church, i.e. Anglican, was not pure enough. And so that the English state church back a few hundred years ago had to be purified more. And therefore, the church should be more biblical. And they wanted to do away with what they thought were too many Roman Catholic traditions that had remained. To this end, the, the Congregationalists, the Puritans, believed in, well, congregational government. And also, they believed in a purified worship. And when you think of those congregational meeting houses, those simple, beautiful, white meeting houses, instead of fancy Anglican cathedrals, you can see their theology, that worship must be simplified and according to the word of God. Now, let's take a quick look at the history of congregationalism. It actually goes back into the 16th century, but basically it's the mid 17th century where congregationalism is really created. Now, if you remember your history in the 17th century, a couple of things are going on. In England, the Puritans had taken over. It's called the Commonwealth. They actually killed the king and the Puritans had taken over England. At the same time, a bunch of colonists are coming to New England and founding a new country. Between 1620 and 1660 is really the beginning of congregationalism. In 1620, the first separatist pilgrims came to New England on Plymouth Rock, and most Americans know this story. Now, these were separatists. They wanted to leave the Church of England altogether. However, in 1630, the first Puritans came to New England. Now, the Puritans and pilgrims are very similar. The pilgrims are actually much more radical because they just wanted to separate from everything. The Puritans thought you could still purify the state church. And pretty soon, these two groups, who, which strongly believed in Reformed theology, became one. And they would create New England. Matter of fact, they would give themselves a new name. And so around 1642, a pastor named John Cotton in Boston, great theologian, coined the term Congregationalism to define these pilgrims and these Puritans. Well, back in England, they were having the Westminster Assembly. The government, controlled by the Puritans, called for a new statement of faith for the English church. And that assembly was dominated by Presbyterians. And they would go on to write the great Presbyterian statement of faith, the Westminster Confession of Faith. However, there were a few Congregationalists at this meeting. And in 1644, they would write the apologetic narration, which was a statement of congregational government trying to persuade the Westminster Assembly to become congregational. It failed. Westminster went Presbyterian. But however, back in the United States in 1648 in Cambridge, Massachusetts, the Congregationalists got together and created the Cambridge Platform, which is considered the most famous statement of congregational government. And in 1658, the Congregationalists took the Westminster Confession of Faith and slightly changed it. 
and made it congregational in government. And so the Savoy Declaration became the official statement of the congregational faith. And thus, the critical creeds of traditional biblical congregationalism was the Westminster Larger and Shorter Catechisms, those catechisms created by the Westminster Assembly, which are used by both Presbyterian and Congregationalists because they don't talk about government, the Cambridge Platform, the Great Statement of Congregational Government, and the Savoy Declaration of Faith, the Great Statement of Congregational Theology. So, Congregationalism did well for several decades, but pretty soon a problem started to creep in. By the 17th century, Congregationalism was going liberal, if not before then. And you can see that in some critical dates. In 1701, Yale was founded, Yale University. Why? Because Harvard was going too liberal. And the Connecticut Congregationalists were worried about those crazy people up in Massachusetts. So they wanted to found a better seminary. In 1750, Jonathan Mayhew would preach his very famous sermon in Boston concerning unlimited submission which basically was a call for the American Revolution. It was one of the first uh, statements calling for revolt against the English crown. Now, this is good for America. However, it shows you a change, a turning away from biblical Christianity to concern of politics and liberty and freedom. And Mayhew himself was Unitarian. As a matter of fact, in 1779 in Gloucester, Massachusetts, the first Unitarian church was founded in the colonies, a church that denies the doctrine of the Trinity, one of those fundamental congregational beliefs. So congregationalism goes liberal very early. Now liberalism defined is the belief or the theology that individual reason, experiences, and or feelings trump the Bible. So the self is more important than the written word of God. And also that the faith must be updated to go with modern times. You know, the word of God might teach A, but that doesn't go with our time so we can change it to B and still be good Christians in theory. Well, theological liberalism is a heresy. It is simply a rejection of Christianity. And unfortunately, the Congregationalists go liberal earlier and in a harder way than any other denomination it gets dominated by theological liberalism by the 19th century. And you see that in current congregationalism. For instance, in the statement of the National Association of Congregational Christian Churches called the Three C's, they define congregationalism not by its great creeds, but that everyone has individual freedom to define the faith as they want. Now that at first might sound nice, but it's insanely dangerous. It is a rejection that God has spoken it with clarity and that is heresy god has spoken he's he is knowable his word is clear even worse in the largest congregational denomination the united church of christ that denomination is fully pagan they embrace the worst forms of sexual perversion and completely reject the word of god matter of fact when you drive by congregational churches this day and age it's mostly associated with rainbow flags out in front, which is just a tragedy. So there are really two different congregational traditions, big C congregationalism. There is biblical, historic, confessional congregationalism of the Puritans, of those great early creeds of congregationalism, which is beautiful. And then there's theological liberalism of 99% of modern congregational churches. Now you might say to me, wait a minute, Pastor Doug, isn't there are conservative congregational denominations out there? Well, there is the four C's, the Conservative Congregational Christian Conference, and yes, they believe in inerrancy and, and some of the basic tenets of the Christian faith. However, they're not congregational in the big C sense, just the small c. They believe in congregational government, and they're Christians, but they're more focused on modern pragmatic evangelicalism. You don't have any denomination out there that actually affirms historic biblical creedal congregationalism and so this leads to some really big questions is congregationalism dead well if you mean congregational government the answer is no many denominations in the united states and throughout the world very much believe in a democratic form of church government that's going well but if you mean in the narrow sense 
of historic confessional congregationalism, of denominations that have the name congregational on it, or churches that have the name congregational on it, and affirm the great Puritan creeds of its heritage? Is that dead? Probably so. There's very few left. So, does that mean there's no hope? Oh, quite the opposite. The congregational tradition in the good sense does exist. Not so much in the name congregationalist, but their theology, that reform theology, that purified biblical theology is found in many good denominations, both Presbyterian, Baptist, and others, which have on some level congregational government, but more importantly, affirm the great congregational reformed faith. Some of the largest conservative denominations teach the theology of the early Puritans. And some of the greatest theologians over the last few decades believe in this theology. R.C. Sproul, Vody Bachman, John MacArthur, J.I. Packer are all from this reformed theology from the Puritans. Matter of fact, in 2007, Time Magazine listed the top 10 new ideas that are changing the world right now. And one of them was Calvinism, or reformed theology that theology of the early Congregationalists. So, is biblical, traditional, creedal Congregationalism dead? In the sense of having the label Congregationalism, yeah. But the theology that drove the early Puritans, that is going well. And will continue to go well to the end of the age. Because, at least in my opinion, it's simply biblical Christianity. Well, I hope that helps. And as always, Christ's grace and peace to you all. Amen.